Yeah, hi, and, and welcome back. As you know, we've been focusing on various themes in uh, the anthropological study of religion. Uh, the last several lectures have been looking at religion around the world. We have a couple loose ends, so let me get right to that, and, 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 and we'll close that out and move on to another, another theme. If you remember, we were talking about Islam, and it's important on Islam is, especially these days, it's easy to associate it with a particular country, Arabic. By the way, do you know the difference between what makes somebody an Arab? What makes somebody an Arab? They look that way. No. No. What makes someone an Arab? If you speak an Arabic language, you're an Arab. Does everybody who believes in Islam speak an Arabic language? Does Muhammad Ali speak Arabic? No. Does he believe in Islam? Yes. Okay. You have to make a, a distinction here. In China, there is lots of Chinese Hui, H-U-I, uh, and they speak Mandarin, uh, and they believe in Islam. Uh, point. Islam is a religion that appeals to many different cultures, many different language groups. Uh, it, it gets press in America, and we seem to see it associated with the Mideast. But even in the Mideast, you must be careful, because take Iran. What language is spoken in Iran? Not Arabic, yeah? No, you knew that. And only the elite speak English. It's Persian or Farsi. Right? Um, Iranians uh, believe in Islam, but they're not Arabic-speaking people. Uh, and, and more interesting in Islam, there's two large sects. One's called the Sunni, that's S-U-N-N-I, and that probably makes up about 90% of most uh, uh, Islamic uh, believers. In Iran, though, they're the Shiites. That's S-H-I-T-E. Okay? And probably 90% of everyone in Iran is Shiites. The Shiites only make up 10%, and a large proportion of them are in, in Iran. So we see here is a complicated story, don't we, between uh, Muslim being linked to the culture and a linguistics group in terms of our popular understanding. But if you go into the world, you see it's a lot more complicated than we might have suspected on that, which gets to another very important point, the difference between culture and religion here. Most of you all know about female amphibia, and it's often associated with Middle East countries. And, and it's very easy to suspect that this is part of the Quran, that the Quran says that part of a woman coming to age is that she has to have a type of circumcision, so where the clitoris is, is nicked off. Right? Um, there is nothing in the Quran that says that, nothing. So why do people do it? It's part of an old tribal cultural tradition that just continues through time. Do all Islamic people, or all believers of Islam, engage in that? No. Take in America, black Muslims. Okay? They're African Americans who believe in Islam. Okay? Uh, they don't practice that. Take China, the Chinese way. The Chinese Muslims do not believe in Islam, but do not practice that because it's not part of their cultural tradition. So we see a religious cosmology and cultural traditions are often very different. And what's true in one area is not true in another. Uh, by the way, in terms of what you, most of you probably have already heard about is the idea that, the, that you can be, have four wives. Okay. In order to be saved, do you need to have four wives? The answer is no. Okay, it just says it could be, it's allowed, it's tolerable. Most people in the Islamic world only have one wife. Okay? Uh, let's, so we see the thing here between doctrines and tribal customs are, are often two different things. So if you're looking at Islam as a cosmology, you must separate it from some of its local understandings. And since most of us don't really study cosmology unless it's going to be on an exam, we pick it up here and there from newspapers. And so it's very easy to, to assume that they go together. So I hope if this is on the test, which I think it will be, I hope you know the difference. Uh, okay, let's, let's move on now in terms of Islam, and let's go into some theories of uh, religion as, 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 as we look at it. The theories of religion are kind of confusing. So let me just pop in and just give you two large overviews, just to help. 
One group of, of writers and thinkers from the 19th century on have really been attracted to the idea that not everybody in the world believes in monogamy. Not just monogamy, monotheism, excuse me. That is the belief in one God. Christian-based religions, there's one God. In Islam, there's one God. But if you look around at a tribal or more simpler societies, you find that they believe in many gods, and some cultures don't believe in, 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 in any gods. They just believe in spiritual forces. And this has really attracted thinkers. And they go, why? Why would the pygmies not believe in any god? Why do they just believe there's inanimate spirits floating around or in the rivers and in the rocks and in the trees, all right? Now, that's fascinating. And what happens is, is they begin to look, is there a relationship between the level of social complexity in a particular community, particular society, and whether or not they believe in many gods, one god, or no gods? And that is really structured almost 100 years of research uh, by a particular group of people, cultural evolutionists. One person earliest was Tyler. And Tyler said, look, clearly there's a notion of social complexity. And the essence of religion is animism. That is the belief in spiritual beings. And they're everywhere. Uh, a French man working in almost in the same time, a little bit later than Tyler, but kind of the same academic generation, thought it through and he says there's something even more fundamental than the belief in spiritual beings and that is the belief in spiritual forces which he called animatism. Now most of you as young kids uh, were raised without realizing it with a kind of animistic background. When you were reading about Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader and let the force be with you that is part of these writers, Moret and, and Tyler, would be arguing part of what you'd find in simpler societies, this, this sense that the essence of the spirituality, remember now what spirituality is, it's the sense of, you, of, of, of yourself connecting with something larger, that rush of that realization of movement, if you will, that process. Okay? So that sense of spirituality is found everywhere, but people then conceptualize the spirituality differently. It forces spiritual beings. Right? That's kind of interesting. The next great intellectual tradition in, in the West of trying to grasp the religious phenomena comes from the psychologists, particularly the psychoanalytical school of Freud and Jung uh, and, and, and others and their disciples. And they're very interesting because what they argue is that what you are suffering from is projection. That is, there really are children of the Enlightenment. There's a real world that you can get with the five senses. And anything in your mind is something you've internalized through childhood fears, through adult fears, and then you've projected it back onto the unknown. Freud thought religion was all made up. He just thought it was just childhood fears and you projected it onto the unknown. Now, Freud was right. We do know in, in the sense of projection. He was right in the sense of projection. Humans do project fears. Okay. No disagreement. That would be a consensus on that. All right? Now, question, though. There is no consensus that the projection of a god is related to fears. That was Freud's particular theory. Uh, but you see, if the anthropologists were trying to account for the relationship between social complexity and the belief in the crystallization of a god image from forces to beings to, 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 a, to an entity, a distinct one uh, monotheistic entity, uh, Freud thought, what a stupid activity. This is all projection. Just focus on, on, on childhood. Now, Jung, and it's not Jung. When you say Jung, you hurt me. Say, say Jung, okay, uh, uh, was a, 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 a French uh, Swiss a thinker. He was a disciple. Some people thought uh, Freud's greatest disciple. Uh, and he breaks with Freud. He thinks that Freud's wrong. He thinks that there's something to religion. He thinks we're projecting. But notice the difference. We're not projecting the internalization of childhood fears onto the unknown. What we're projecting is mental templates. That is, we're really uh, projecting is archetypal messages or themes that were given to us by God. And his position is, is no religion got it right, but every religion around the world got it right in a little bit. And so he thought if you can look at all the religions and compare and contrast and you look for their universal archetypes, 
you might be able to get a sense of what was the essence of God's purpose. I, I note this only because here you have a psychoanalytical tradition and which is saying it's all made up and looking for the hidden logic behind it. Jung is saying it's not made up. There is a world, there is a world that's independent of this material world, and but we can only get at it through glimpses. Interesting position. Uh, let's move on. The the third great theme. Okay. You have the anthropologist looking at social complexity in the belief in spirituality. The second is the psychoanalytical tradition looking at whether or not this reflects human universals or in some sense of just underlying uh, uh, fearful conflict. The third big thing is the sociologist. Sociologists say, look, how do we know what the essence of religion is? How will we ever know? We want to understand what people are doing right now. Is there anything... Is there any value in studying religion that will help us understand society? Who cares if it's real or not real? If people believe it's real, it's real in its consequences, right? If you think somebody has a gun, and they don't, but you really think they do, you're going to act a certain way. If you think a dog is a mean dog, and it's not a mean dog, you're going to act a certain way. If you think a dog's a kind dog and it's a mean dog, you're going to act, right? It's what you think will structure how you behave. That's the essence of the sociological critique. Right? Uh, and there's two large theories, and if you've taken any social classes, you'll have heard these in some ways. And, but don't dismiss it. They're on to something. One is Emile Durkheim, a uh, French sociologist. And he argued he could divide the world up into the sacred and to the profane. What he meant by the sacred was is that all cultures, all human beings, in order to be human, have to have values. There are things that they, not everything is of equal weight. People tend to think this is better than that. And and when they think certain things are better than that, they tend to cherish those. They want to protect those. And he thought a wonderful way to study or just to learn about another subgroup or another culture is find out what do they value. Right? We've well, already suspected when we started is a difference between religion and spirituality. And we all agreed that, look, religion is a formal organization, but you can be religious by not belonging to a religious organization. Right? We've all said that. Durkheim would agree. But he even goes a little bit farther. Because to Durkheim, you could be an atheist, which is what? I don't believe in God. Okay? If you say that, you're classified as an atheist. But from the Durkheimian point of view, do atheists, as human beings, do they have values that they cherish more than other values? What do you think? They say, I don't believe in God. Does that mean they're valueless? Right. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Okay. They can say, I don't believe in the cosmology that posits a God, but I still have values that are important to me. And Durkheim would say, those values that are important to that person or to that community, we could go in and talk about as a religion. These are the essence of that group's, that individual's spirituality. And if we want to understand that community better, we must understand that which they value. Okay, uh, So Durkheim posited the notion of sacred profane. Profane is P-R-O-F-A-N-E, and it could just be secular, okay? sacred and secular. Uh, for example, America. You all know about burning of the flag. Now, on one level, burning of the flag is a secular statement. I'm angry at the government's policy this particular year or on this particular issue. In fact, I am so embarrassed by the government's policy. I'm so angry at the government's policy. Kind of a cherished value, isn't it? I'm going to show my disdain by burning it. Right? And we all know people looking at it get upset. Why? Okay. Now, cognitively, they can realize it's just a piece of cloth that represents the United States of America, which is just a political creation. Right? But at an emotional level, at a non-thinking level, people react a little upset. Because why? Because the flag becomes a symbol of the larger union they belong to. And it looks like this person's not making a political statement, but actually mocking 
values that they have, and therefore the ambivalence, due to the point. We're really troubled by that. Uh, we have no problem putting flags on cars because that's upholding that, even though it's a political statement. But if you burn the flag, which is another political statement, that doesn't seem to be upholding us. See, Durkheim would say, now that's interesting. If you want to understand the American soul, focus on flag burning and this tension between a secular statement and a sacred value. If you all know that, you can begin to understand the American religion. I'm going to say more about the American religion coming up. Okay, uh, But Durkheim said, look, it's not just about America. We could do the same thing with France. We could do the same thing with Germany. We could do the same thing for China. It's been pointed out, looking at communist governments, that you often see the Communist Party, uh, you certainly have certain, take, take Russia. People have looked at, at Lenin as being, being the god, creating the, the found, Marx being the god, Lenin being the prophet, and Stalin being the prophet, and these people are all held up in kind of a religious tradition. So they've even argued that governments who come into being arguing there is an atheist position, people wind up conceptualizing them you know, as in some sense upholding a sacred charter. And that's the point that Durkheim's analysis. Every group, every group, whether you're in Vegas, whether you're in LA, whether you're in Maine, has a sacred charter. And how do you get at that sacred charter? You find out what they value. You just don't go in and say, what's your religion? You really want to know, what do you really value? Max Weber, not Weber, it's not Weber bread. It's the German E with the A, you pronounce it Weber. Uh, uh, Max Weber is one of the few geniuses in the social sciences. Uh, dead at 55 from the great 1918 uh, influenza uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, and he thought religion was extremely important to study. Why? He thought Marx was right. There is a material reality. It does shape group formations. It does shape a type of consciousness. But he thought Marx went too far by saying there was only the material reality. Weber thought there was also a, a spiritual side, like Durkheim. But it was a spiritual side that came about what? The essence of religion was about the future. To Weber's point is that whatever the future held and how you thought you could get to that future would structure your behavior. Let me put it another way. We live our life out not in the past, but we live our life out in the future. Everyone taking this course has a future. You all want to accomplish something. How, what you want to become in the future will shape your character and your conduct right now. Okay? Let me a little aside. Sophomores in college, who drinks wine and mixed drinks versus beer kegs? Who? Okay. Do, do male or female students tend to drink as sophomores? It's very interesting. You find freshmen drink kegs much more than seniors. Why? Keg beer is kind of working class. It's cheap. You can just party. Okay. When you start becoming a junior and senior, you're consciously becoming aware that I'm going to be moving into the professional world. I want, notice what, I want to move into the professional world. And so what you do is you begin to sh shift and your beverages of choice. Beer in our culture is more of a working class, a, a, a beverage. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a slumber party thing. Wine and mixed drinks are part of a professional class, so you begin shifting it over. What you want to be in the future is how you begin acting. What's this have to do uh, right now? What's this have to do with Christianity? A lot. Where is the paramount reality? The Weber said, what you want to know is what do people think is the most important reality? Is it right now or is it in the future? Now, it's interesting in Christianity because everyone believes in heaven. You believe, you know, that God, uh, that God is a nice God. Therefore, if you mess up real bad, you still ain't going to go to hell because he's a nice God. He's taken Psych 101. He knows that you have issues and he's going to overlook it. So we don't worry about going to hell. Right? What we really want to do is go to heaven. And, but is heaven really the paramount reality? Do every day when you get up, do you ask, how can I act today in order to please God 
so I may be rewarded with heaven. Do you do that? But you, most people don't do that. This is a fundamental shift. Heaven is a reality, but it's no longer the paramount reality for the average American. The average American, in many ways, is no different than the average pygmy. Remember the animistic, don't believe in God? You have a God, and you say it, and there's a heaven. But for most Americans, what's real, and you go to church and you do the things, but for most Americans, what's really important is the material social world right now. Okay? doesn't mean you don't have values that you want to uphold in that world, but you no longer get up every day fearful that a raffle God will smite you if you don't obey his commandments, absolutely. We used to believe that. Puritans used to believe that. And because they believed that in the 18th century, they acted in daily life very differently than you do. Both Christians, you're Christians now, they were Christians. But you no longer believe the way the Puritans believed. You see the difference? Weber says this is significant. It's not just cosmology. It's the emphasis. Where is the most important reality in whatever you personally believe? Now, if there's some people taking this class, you can send me emails and say, no, I'm that way. Every day I get up and say how I can do it. And I would say that supports Weber's point. Right? That, A, I don't think you're typically American anymore. But if you are going that way, if the paramount reality is that so important, that's exactly how you should act. And the fear of not getting to heaven is so strong that you changes your character and your conduct. For most Americans, that is not an issue. The God that you believe in is not an angry God of the Old Testament. It's the kind God of the New Testament. And this kind God is taken, Psych 101. He's generous to a fault. And therefore, you can worry about, am I drinking the right beverage to get to this social class? Am I wearing the right clothes to get to that social class? Am I learning the right mannerisms to move to that social party? You see? Because for most Americans, that is the most important reality. Although we still maintain the cosmology of Christianity and a heaven and a hell, it's no longer really critical. The paramount reality to us is society. Okay, let me move on. Society. Let's look at America. Does America have a religion? Now, a lot of you would think, yeah, Christianity. Okay. What about Judaism? Okay, you'd say maybe Judeo-Christianity. What about the Muslims in America? African-American Muslims and just more recent immigrants from the Mideast. Uh, it's okay, yeah, they're there too. What about Hindus? You ever been to LA? Venice Beach? Every year they have the Hare Krishna party? Right? Yeah, okay, it's small, granted, small. But America has many, many religions, right? And so you might say, well, they have many religions, but the dominant one is Christianity. You're correct. But is there another religion here other than the official Sunday? base religion. Now, you're probably confused. You probably said, what's the answer? Come on, look, let's go back to Durkheim. If you want to understand what's religious to a group, you must see what they cherish and what they value. You don't just go to their formal cosmology. You have to look at how they act every single day. And you have to see what's articulated in newspapers, what's argued about, what are the sources of the conflict in that society, and you can know. So what's that mean by America? People have argued that there's a civil religion in America. It's not based on the Bible, though it certainly influences it a bit, but it's not there. It has a whole different set of symbols and a whole different idea. What is this civil religion? It's the idea of worshiping America as a religion in and of itself. Wait a minute, I don't, I don't do that, you might say. Well, do you? Let's take a look at this argument. The argument is that America is very unique. It never had a national religion. Christianity clearly influenced a lot of values, but there was never a state religion. Right? That people got up and said, we as Americans believe in this religion, and this is the religion everyone must belong to in order to become an American. If you want to become an American, how do you become an American? Okay. Take a little test. And is the test based on, uh, do you believe in God? 
Does God have a trinity? Can you recite the book of Deuteronomy? No. To take that little test, what do you do? It's a literacy test, and you have to know a little bit about what? American history, and particularly the Constitution. Right? Now, you might think, okay, that's good. We just want to get immigrants in to know a little bit about the country. But let's look farther. The argument is, is that America really has a civil religion where there are certain core values that all Americans share. So we're from many different immigrant countries. So that's what we really share. American is an immigrant country. And that experience is what we share with everyone else, even though they come from different places. But we also share something else. The enormous emphasis on the individual. You know, Europeans look back at us and, and are just astounded. They're going, how come you don't have the great ethnic wars that rampage Europe? Right? We have no Northern Ireland versus Southern Ireland and the Catholic and Protestants fighting. We have nothing like Yugoslavia where the Muslims and the Christian, uh, Greek Orthodox Christians are, 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 are slaughtering each other through centuries. And it just goes on and on. Why? Okay. The emphasis on the individual. People come in with strong ethnic concerns, loyalties, and by the second and third generation, they are completely assimilated into an American uh, a mainstream. But get the point, Durkheim. What do Americans value? Okay. And the idea is you're valuing the individual, but you're valuing something more. You're valuing the idea of self-development, the idea that life is a journey in which you are working for new experiences to become a better self. Remember Weber? Where's the paramount reality here? Are Americans this great Christian nation? Are we working to please God and so that we may get a better place in heaven? Now, there are some subgroups that do move that way. We'll be talking about that in a minute. But for the average Las Vegan, L.A., West Coast, East Coast, who goes to church every Sunday, is that what's motivating them? Or do they organize their life Monday through Sunday, really? Okay, on, can I go to this trip? Should I go to Europe? Should I study? How many of you want to go abroad to study? Do you, do you want to, and why? Is it to get a good job? Yeah. But else you're going to learn stuff, right? Uh, UNLV, by the way, if I can make a, a pitch here for the international students thing, you should really, if you don't know about it, you should find out about it. By Susan Thompson, it has some wonderful study abroad programs, uh, like in, from Italy to Costa Rica to China, now into Czechoslovakia and, and, and England, and I really totally recommend it. Why? Not only will you learn and continue your progress towards your degree, but you will also have wonderful experiences. Now, why can I say that on, on this station? Why is that valued? I know you value it because the value in America is the development of the self. And by going to live in other countries, you will see and be confronted with new experiences, and that's important to you. Okay? It's the essence in some sense of the religion. But what's that have to do with civil religion? What it is by not having, the argument goes, by not having a state religion, we've made society our religion. Let me prove it to you. Are there icons in America? Are there icons? What is an icon? An icon is a material object that has a particular value, a kind of a sacred value. It's a cherished thing that you really, really believe in. What are, so what are some of the American icons? Okay. But the Liberty Bell. Do you know, like last week, there was a whole thing that terrorists might break the Liberty Bell? What is this Liberty Bell? It's big copper bells, a crack in it. And, you know, and they're surrounded by two guards there, ready to make sure no one's going to blow up the Liberty Bell. And you imagine if you open up the newspaper, you'd say, uh, Liberty Bell was blown up. Liberty Bell hasn't been rung for 100 years, okay? And it's just there in this little object. But why, why would that even be important to us? And why would everybody be a little sad? And what if we said that, that oh, they, the government just ran out of funds and there was no guards, and so they, they did that? We'd go, oh, that's terrible. My point is, the Liberty Bell is not important to you, but you'd feel upset if something happened to it. Why? It connects us to part of the civil religion, the founding charter of America. Look at how many people don't know who the presidents were after Abraham Lincoln. You have not a clue. You don't have to know who the presidents were after Thomas Jefferson. You don't have a clue, and you're not alone. 
But you do know George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. You know Ben Franklin, right? Why? Why? And not that you just know them. Even when there's periodic muckraking books about their biography of themselves come out, we all listen to it, we go, oh boy, I didn't know that, that was interesting. And then we forget about it, we go back to thinking of these people the way they are, as these kind of like spiritual icons. These represent, in some senses, is not, and we don't really care what their actual life was, because they serve as an ideal, an objectification of what we'd like to be. Remember Weber's thing about the paramount reality? It's not getting into heaven, it's being a more perfect person for this world. Washington and Jefferson uphold certain ideals. People are created equal. We make a fetish of equality. Equality is a very important value to us. Not equality in results. We're not into distributing everybody's wealth and making everyone the same. What we are into the notion of opportunity. Every individual has the right to explore and become different. Right? What are icons? How about the Constitution? How about the Declaration of Independence? You know, when I was a senior, we went to uh, Washington, D.C., and we got in this line, and we saw one of the original, or if not the original, copy of the Declaration of Independence. And it was right in my, my history book. You know, it was reproduced in the back of the book like everyone did. But this was the actual one, and we walked up, and there was this guy explaining that this was a multi-million dollar uh, protection seal, and if any bomb went off or the building was bombed, it would go into a vault and it would be protected it. And, he's, and, it, and I still remember it, he says, because that way of protecting our way of life. And I thought to myself, well, this document is in my history textbook. I mean, it's in everybody's. Who cares if this particular document's destroyed? The ideas, the message is there, right? But I was a little naive, wasn't I? Because the essence of the icon is that this was one of the sacred partridges that, that Thomas Jefferson actually signed. It wasn't a reproduction. So what was being held up here? It wasn't the idea. We have it published everywhere. That wasn't going to be lost. It was the sacred parchment. What made it sacred? These men wrote on it, and somehow this was the essence of our, of, of our civilization. Okay? What other icons might there be? What about the Washington Monument? Right? World Trade Center. World Trade Center was an icon of American business success, certainly an icon of, of New York City in terms of its skyscraper and what a city it was. And in an odd way, it connected a bit to America. But I wonder, what would hit us more if the World Trade Center collapsed, killing all those thousands and thousands of people? Okay? Or if the White House had a plane going into it. The president's not there. The vice president's not there. Maybe 40, 50 people are killed. What would reverberate more in America? You with me? Icons are important. And I think it would be the White House. I think it would really disturb most people. Uh, and as we do know, people were looking for the White House. They took the Pentagon because they couldn't. They couldn't. Uh, they didn't have the expertise to hit it. It looks like. Uh, so uh, the terrorists understood the American icon. Right? We just take it for granted because it's part of our culture. But that's Durkheim's point. Just because it's part of your culture and you don't think about it in a formal way, such as like right now in this class you are. But most people don't. Right after this class you won't. That fact does not make it not a sacred value. And how do we know what's value is sacred versus another? It's how you respond when something bad happens. Then you know yourself it's important. And what's the point? Don't lose it here. Does America have a civil religion that in some sense rivals Christianity in terms of its, import, in terms of its value essence? Okay. Really compli it really, they complement one another. But it's interesting. The American civil religion in some senses qualifies our take on the values of Christianity, which are wide open, but the ones we choose to emphasize are also very consistent with the American values. All right? Let's go on. Okay. Pilgrimages. Are there pilgrimage places? Okay. In Christianity, are there? Sure, you can go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, you can go, you can go to uh, Bethlehem. There's a, the, my parents went there, and, and there was this place where they said Christ served Mask, and they certainly had to go there and do it, and they had this incredible feeling. It wasn't just Mass, it was Mass in the actual rock cave where Christ might have, uh, might have said service, and this reverberated to them, and it was very moving for them. Lots of people go to Jerusalem and, and, and around the 
what for them is the biblical uh, part of their religion, it, it, and it's very important. Some people go to Rome, want to if they're Catholic, and go to the Vatican and move through that. Uh, so yes, we all know about that. But what about civil pilgrimages? Civil pilgrimages are interesting because we also have them. People go to Washington D.C. You go see the Lincoln Memorial, right? Important. Washington Monument, important. You might go see the Capitol. If you're a go as a group, you've got to have your picture with the Capitol in the background. You know, in front of the Capitol, they have all these stairs that photographers are taking pictures every 30 minutes by groups saying, I was at the Capitol. You, a lot of people have to go to the White House. You go on that tour, right? And you're walking through and you're going, boy, this is interesting, okay? Yeah, we have our pilgrimages in, 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 in terms of that. Uh, holidays. And what about shrines? Does America have shrines? Well, we already talked about the Liberty Bell is kind of a shrine, isn't it? You could say the Washington Monument's that. If you go to Boston, there's Freedom Trail. There's this red thing where you can see where Paul Revere, where his workshop was. You can go where that thing by that, you know, one up by land, two up by sea. The steeple's still there. You can go out to the Concord where the middlemen middle men are. Now, isn't it interesting? I'm joking about words you haven't talked about in a long time, and you all know what I'm talking about because we share this common cultural history, and these are part of our pilgrims, part of our shrines. And what are they designed for? To uphold the value that America is an essence of itself that should be treasured. These people protected that essence, and we do well too. How about holidays? Do we have secular holidays? Fourth of July, Memorial Day. What about Thanksgiving? You know who founded Thanksgiving? Abe Lincoln. There was no Thanksgiving when Thomas Jefferson was president. Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving a national holiday. Why? What was happening when Lincoln was around? Yeah, Civil War. He wanted to unite the nation. He thought a national day. Now notice, too, it was uniting a warring North and South, so it wasn't a national day that was going to celebrate the North over the South or whatever. It was the day the pilgrims, where there was no America, right? And therefore, it was not going to favor the North side or the South side. It was kind of like a common historical beginning. And and that becomes part of our holiday. Uh, we've already talked about sacred texts, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. right? Uh, but we also have very interesting enough in sacred texts as presidential libraries. As you all know now, every president wants to form his own library and all of his papers are collected. In one level, it's our homage to history. But are we going through all of this expense just to make it easier for 12 or 22 historians in the past to go in and get the collections and write a book about that particular president. Is that why we paid all the money? Now, you could understand that you know, a narcissistic, egomaniac president might want to have a library where people, because he can't imagine why anybody wouldn't, wouldn't why, why not people would not want to understand what he did, right? But we give all that money up. We support that. Not to support an egomaniac. Why do we do that? Because we think not only is there a history, which is secular, but we think there might also be part of a sacred heritage that this president has that's carried on. And thereby he represents, or she represents in time perhaps, uh, all of us. Okay, And that is why. Right? I'm trying to make an argument that there's a secular religion that we all participate. Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Christians on this question, for a long time Americans, all share a similar agreement. Right? And Durkheim's point is, if that's true, if these are cherished values, even though they're not articulated as a cosmology, this is a religion. And I'm trying to argue to you, I'm trying to make you rethink here and say, are, do you belong to two religions? The religion you go to on Sunday or whenever the day you go to worship, and this particular religion. And I think the second religion you also belong to, though you don't realize it. Okay? And lastly, are there articles of faith? It's good. You're a little tired. What's an article of faith? Okay. You did it every single day of your life when you started kindergarten. How did all classes begin? The Pledge of Allegiance. Right? Pledge of Allegiance. Do you pledge your commitment to this country? Right? And, and you notice how everyone was saying it in times of crisis. People just do it pro forma, right? How do all uh, big sporting events begin? The national anthem. Right? 
that takes on different meanings, right? Okay. These are all part of our articles of faith. And don't they share certain things in terms of religious uh, uh, doctrine? Right? Certain religions will also have their own articles of faith, and that will move on in that way. Okay? Uh, America, though, to be a full religion, you have to have a vision. Remember Weber? Life orientation. How you orientate yourself to the future. Americans believe that we're on a sacred mission. Okay? Now, most of you don't think about it that much. You really don't. Okay? But don't you believe America is kind of like a good country that's doing, doing the best it can? Right? Now, what, uh, during the Vietnam War, that notion of the sacred mission was really challenged by lots of Americans. And it was very interesting in how it was couched. It was really not a pragmatic, we're losing too many people, the war costs too much. Spank America, our president said during, the, tri- during the, the hearings, that this war is bad for business. All right? But most of the debate during the Vietnam War was not about whether it was good for business or bad for business. Right? What it was arguing about was the sacred mission. Did America have that obligation to stop the spread of communism? Did, was America violating its own sacred mission by crushing an independent people who wanted to be free in a different way? To the issue? Were they be, was, it, were they, was America upholding the people's right to be free, being crushed by communism? Did these people want to be communists or, or in their own twist or their own uh, slant on communism and, and, and thereby be free? So both groups, the pro war and the anti war, both argued not whether America was on a sacred mission but whether America misunderstood its sacred mission. They all agreed America should protect, make the world better. The argument was whether this particular country, the designs and the sides they were on, whether it was going to do that. You with me? But there was a great agreement that America had a sacred mission. Now, part of the post-Vietnam War became a sense of cynicism by intellectuals. Some intellectuals pulled way back and said, the sacred mission of Americans is not good. And, and in many ways, the people who were young are now still in academia all throughout America. And in many ways, they still maintain the notion that America was distorted in its sacred mission. This was a bad choice. And they still bring a kind of like a, a critique. And the recent terrorist bombings have been very interesting because many academics came out on the side of, of not the terrorists, no, just, no one said this was good, but they all wanted to see it as they were responding to lots of misgivings in the world. And by doing that in some ways, they were kind of like trying to give an explanation for why it took place. Okay? Now, other academics refused to go there. And all I want to make a point here is not whether this is good or bad, but the idea is, is that this was a minority view this time. When the Vietnam War had teach-ins, it was packed in by 70% of all academics because it really had shifted. This time around, it only got about 20%. And, 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 and it suggests to me that the notion of the sacred mission, that America's sense of moral goodness, is creeping back in. And it's only when an academic puts on his thinking cap that he realizes, no, this is a value. But when he's a regular human being, which is really most of the time, the cultural value of America's mission is part of that particular person's view, too. So sacred mission. We're out to save the world. We're going to make it better. Uh, We believe that we're righteous. How many of you really believe when America does stuff, it's really always wrong? Uh, some of you are writing down, yeah, I do, I do, I do, okay. But, but there is, if you run through America, we have a kind of a faith that, that, that for the most part we are righteous, okay? We also value moderation, okay? Now, this is an important point, and it's, and it's not mine. And I can't remember the historian who uh, noted it, but it's a wonderful point. America, in this one historian's view, is just as imperialistic in sentiment however it wanted to talk about sacred values and faith and righteousness, however that was shared by the regular masses, American political establishment was just as imperialist as Russia or China. But because we value the notion of people's choice, the way we took in new territory was through states. You had to vote. You had to want to become in. We took over the Philippines. We left the Philippines because most Filipinos did not want to become a state in America. 
any time the majority of the people in Puerto Rico want to vote and be, want to become the 51st state, they will. Right? So, uh, there's lots of tax advantages and historical reasons and why they're trying to balance it and, and that sort of thing. However, it's in, in, in this sense, the, the Puerto Rican intellectuals or nationalist intellectuals are really wrong because they're saying that what's holding America, uh, Puerto Rico not being an independent country is all these other economic uh, vested interests. And the whole problem they have is there's constantly plebiscites or voting on whether they should go this way or that way. Point. Because of Americans' cultural logic of incorporating foreign cultures through a state system, it's really prevented us from just taking over huge populations and camping, the way Russia took over East Europe, the way China would move out through its borders into other neighboring country states. It didn't matter if the people wanted to belong or not. China's army was there, and now they belonged. In our case, it does matter. And so that value restricts, if you will, this other global imperialistic impulse. Okay, Move on. Um, value of, of uh, moderation. Two, two points on, on America, and then we'll, we'll shift to ritual. Uh, Americans is very interesting. We emphasize ourselves to be free-speaking, spontaneous people, upholding individual. And that value, in many ways, covers up another value that's more important, the value of moderation. Right? You want people just to validate you. We really don't want people to say, hey, let's critique this class, or let me critique your life, or what an outrageous thing this is. We don't even want people to really call themselves. We don't mind entertainers because they're in a certain area and they can do that. We even don't mind college professors because they're a type of entertainer and they're in a certain area and they can be outrageous and that makes it interesting. But they're not in a social setting. It goes really under the entertainment block. In terms of the people you interact every day, you really like people who just like you and you like them. They don't bring up anything that's troubling, you don't bring up anything that's troubling, and we all just kind of get along. That is one of the great values in American society. Right? And, and, and it really emphasizes, if you will, a type of conformity. And woe to any of you taking this class who really come in and think that Americans value individual expression in every context you will discover that you will be shunned, annoyed, and avoided. Americans do not value individual expression in every context. What they value is people who can form and just hang out and tell them you're doing good. What we want from other Americans is just people to say, you're wonderful. What a great idea. I like that dress. Haircut couldn't be better. Okay? That's the person you want to go to lunch with. Okay. America. Let's move on. Um, ritual and religion. Okay. Uh, let me say something, and we don't have much time for this segment, and we'll take this into the next. Uh, the book. Very important book, uh, Ritual Life in Rural Greece. Uh, there are going to be several questions on the exam. I I think it's very important for you in many ways to start that book by reading all the photographs. The photograph, I think, has 40 or 50 with some nice description. Read the photographs first because it gives you a whole sense of the, of the religious experience. And then I want you to key in on the chapters that have to do with the women's roles. There's two or three, and that's it. It's a short book. I want you to know is why... How does the anthropologist explain the concept that the wounds will never heal? You know, Greek women, when they bury the body, will stay in mourning for over five years, where they then, after five years, will dig up the body again, washing the bones, cherishing them, praying over them, and then reburying them. Okay. Why? Why do they do it? It's called a double burial. In southern China, they do it, too. Why? Why didn't rule Greece? I want you to know why. Uh, second thing is, why do they say the wounds will never heal? Okay. What does that mean? What does that tell us about rule Greek cosmology, that they continue this kind of like internal grieving? And third thing I want you to key on is, what's the role of women in rule Greece society? Remember, this is not Athens. This is rule Greece. Okay. Uh, what are the values of those women? 
what are their relationships to men? Okay. And, and how important are they to the mourning process? This gets to the issue of power. Uh, it gets to the issue of women's importance in society. And on one hand, you might think women have not very much value and not much money authority. Let's go into the religious world and see if that's true. Okay, those are the questions. If you know those, you're going to be fine for the exam, plus you're going to get wonderful stuff out of the book. Let's go on then. Ritual. What is ritual? And ritual has many things. Ritual means that um, it's based on a repetition. When you brush your teeth, is that a ritual? You go, yeah. We use it in English, a ritual is that way. Yes, it's a repetition. But in anthropology, ritual means something more than just repetition. It's repetition. But it also means something where the, it leads to a transcendental experience. Okay? So brushing your teeth, you're the same person at the start of the ritual as you were at the end of the ritual. Uh, ritual is critically important to being human. I must admit, in my life, I kind of miss this. I bought the American individual ideal that you should be it. You should really go against ritual. And it wasn't until later that I started studying groups and I started realizing that ritual practices were critically important to maintaining a sense of culture. Let me explain. Some people have argued that, Amer that Amer not Americans, that human beings are incredibly selfish. That we, are, we live our lives out kind of in isolation and that we need to learn to be sociable. We need help in being sociable. We much more prefer our own company, at the same time yearning to be connected to others. Kind of a paradox, isn't it? Uh, monkeys don't have that problem. Baboons don't have that problem. Chimps and homo sapiens do. And a ritual. Rituals become critically important. Why? Because they're a way that these isolated human beings, that's you, you need ritual to help you facilitate connecting with another human being. You might think, what do you mean, what do you mean? Okay. You meet people in the hall, what do you say? Hi, how's it going? Nice to see you. Good morning. Going to take a TV show. I'm going to read a book. These are kind of ritual. No, everyone knows that you're not going to sit and, and talk, but you're kind of greeting one another. Uh, continuing on, you go to a party, you just meet, notice what you do. You might say, oh, how long have you been here? Do you like Vegas? These are just safe questions as two strangers set down this ritualistic little speech that then allows you to, to segue, as the expression is, into talking about other things. Those people who engage in those ritual practices are generally more sociable and more liked. If you're taking this class and you tend not to like it, you tend like to bump start it, let's jump right to the essence, let's don't go through that ritual, I find myself did that, uh, you'll find yourself not liked. And you're not liked, not because you're just not following the social rules. That's a ra ad hoc rationalization. That's not really why. You're not liked because as a, two homo sapiens who don't know one another, they need to follow this little ritual script in order to, to become comfortable. It's kind of like you build up and then you, you go. Okay? Take dating. Uh, if you are dating, you go through a ritual thing too. You don't jump out and say, hey, I look, you look good. Do you think I look good? Do you think we should move in together? And people would go, what? You're crazy. And you would be. You would be for two reasons. One is uh, you're not following a ritual script that says you should do this, 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 and then ultimately discuss that, right? By jumping start right to the end, you are, or you're not following uh, d um, the correct uh, social procedure. You're not allowing people the time and the opportunity. So my point, it's not that you just ask this question, but, but it also raises questions about your own humanity. People who cannot engage in these little rituals, it raises questions about mental illness. Mentally ill people never get the rituals right. They can't engage in them. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are not mentally ill, um, and, and, and therefore you have the rituals right. In fact, you do these so well that you are not even aware of it. 
And I'm just saying, if you look back and look at this interaction, you'll be there. We have a very brief time, and I don't want to go into Van Gennep. Let me just end it with the definitions, and we'll start right off in the next lecture. Uh, Van Gennep argues that all religion... Van Gennep was a French uh, anthropologist, and he wrote a book called Rites of Passage. Wonderful title, isn't it? And he just said that all rituals can be broken up into three phases, separation, transition, or liminality, or reincorporation. What is separation? We'll go into a lot of examples coming up, but just get the definitions down. Separation is, is when you as an individual isolated being are not part of a social group. Uh, then you have a new status, such as a baby. You're born as a baby, uh, but you're just a baby. You're not part of the Christian community yet, or a religious community. There are certain times and places you have to go through, go through uh, a, a new ritual procedure that makes you reborn into that faith. Transition is however long it takes you to be between statuses, right? between statuses. Uh, in, in some religions, you, do, you have a baptism after 30 days. Others, it's up into eight years, 12 years. Uh, in some, it's not until you're an adult. Okay? And so there's different religions have different points of when you are finished that transition. Whatever it is, is when you have that uh, uh, when you're complete, you're now reincorporated. You were a pagan, now you're a Christian. Okay? You've been now reincorporated into that society. Okay? Van Gennep said you could look at every single ritual around the world, and they would all have these phases, which would speak in some sense to an underlying human physiology that seems to break up social experiences in certain ways. Okay. When we come back, I'm going to talk about Van Gennep again in terms of weddings and in terms of funerals. And then we're going to talk also about American swingers and their use of ritual to facilitate and uphold their marriage. Uh, so I'm going to stop here, and, uh, and I will be seeing you next week. If you are interested in this or any other UNLV distance education course, please call us at 702-895-0334.